Welcome, welcome everyone. Glad you're here. All right, welcome everyone. I want to uh, say that we're so excited that you're here with Division 17 Society of Counseling Psychology to this uh, outstanding webinar on exploring liberation psychology, teaching, training, and practice. And we have a superstar panel here that I know that is gonna wow you. And so I wanna quickly introduce them so we can get to the good content. Um, but before I start, I wanna let you know that we've enabled closed captioning um, so that each of you should be able to access automatic transcripts if you want, or you may disable them if, if you want as well. In addition, I wanna let you know that these are, uh, this is, available for continuing education credits, but you have to be here through to the very end in order to get uh, those credits for you. So again, welcome everyone. And I want to uh, introduce our STEAM panel, but first I'll introduce myself. My name is Amy Reynolds. I am the president of the Division of 17 of the Society of Counseling Psychology. And it's my great honor to introduce this amazing uh, group of women. So first we have Dr. Tama Bryant Davis, who's a licensed psychologist, practitioner, professor of psychology at Pepperdine University and director of the Culture and Trauma Research Lab. She is a current candidate for APA president-elect and I do wanna say that Division 17 has endorsed her as our number one candidate and I urge you all to vote. Uh, voting is open between now and October 29th. Tama is also the past president of the American uh, representative to the United Nations and a past president of the Society for the Psychology of Women. Next up in our great panelists is Carrie Castaneda Sound, who's a psych professor also at Pepperdine University, director of the Language, Culture and Gender Research Lab and a licensed psychologist. She's currently president of Division 35, the Society of Psychology of Women, and is on the leadership board for the California Latinx Psychological Association. And finally, we have Dr. Annalise Singh, who serves as the Chief Diversity Officer and the Associate Professor Provost for Diversity and Faculty Development at Tulane. Dr. Singh is, of course, a recent past president of Division 17, and she is a professor of social work with a joint appointment in psychology at Tulane. She is trained as a counselor and counseling psychologist, and their research um, explores racial healing, racial justice, racial liberation and the resilience and resi group resilience, community resilience and liberation experiences, especially of queer and trans people of color. Uh, Dr. Singh is the author of the Racial Healing Handbook and the Queer and Trans Resilience Workbook. So as you can see, superstars, at all three of them. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Tama Bryant, who will do the first presentation. And uh, we hope that you enjoy your time with us. And there will be Q&A at the end, so stay connected and engaged. Over to you, Tama. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the warm welcome and introduction. I'm excited to share this space with you all. I am seeing your messages in the chat and so grateful for my colleagues being willing to co-present on this very important topic. And so let me share my screen. So we want to talk on today about liberation psychology, an overview of it, training and teaching, as well as looking at LGBTQ plus liberation psychology. So my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am a Black woman, a woman of African descent. I like to name my multiple roles, as well as being a psychologist, I'm an ordained minister, a sacred artist, a mother, daughter, sister, partner, friend, activist, scholar, learner, and really resisting those notions that we have to leave the other parts of ourselves behind in order to be professional, but to name that all of your roles and all of your relations inform the ways you show up as a healer and as a practitioner, and so as I show up in the fullness of who I am, I hope you will be present in the listening and the digesting and the application of what we share in the fullness of who you are, that you will take that which aligns with you and you can release or modify that which does not. I want to recognize that I work in land and 
teach and live in the land that has been cultivated by the Tongva people and other indigenous peoples who are the original stewards of this land and continue to be caretakers of this land. I wanna recognize their history, culture, contributions and violations past and present. I also want to do a labor recognition, acknowledging those whose bodies and labor were exploited to build this nation, largely people of African descent. When we recognize the land and the caretakers of the land and those who have labored, we draw a context in which we work that recognizes the importance of a socio-political reality uh, that informs our psychology. I want to name that we are Eden, meeting Eden, during Eden, a time Eden. that we are meeting during a time where there is socio-politically a lot of hostility, instability, and overt violence. I want to name that we are meeting during the time of seeing the treatment of Haitian refugees, seeing the treatment of other immigrants, seeing the realities in Afghanistan, and seeing what is happening in our backyard. We are meeting during the time of a global pandemic. And I want to name as we think about oppression, that oppression is not just something that happens out there, but it is something that happens in here. What does that mean? That oppression shows up in our practice, in our training, in our teaching, in our research. It shows up in our very lives, both being targeted and in terms of us duplicating and replicating oppressive systems that we have learned. I want to give us all permission to resist and reject the myth of neutrality, that uh, the ways in which we make meaning, the ways in which we set our priority, even our treatment planning is important that it is co-created because we come from a particular vantage point. And that does not have to be a barrier or a burden when we have insight, awareness, and humility about who we are. So foundationally, it is important to recognize that oppression, including racism, is bigger than bias. It is not just a matter of one person or some people don't like me. If it was just a matter of some people don't like me, then we could just advise our clients to stay away from those people, to avoid the people who don't like you. But it is important to know that oppression, including racism, uh, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, uh, that those are systemic and that they are protected and maintained by power and privilege. So they affect every aspect of our clients' lives and every aspect of our lives, from housing to banking to employment to education to applications for educational opportunities. Uh, and when we look at the criminal justice or criminal injustice system, we also see the realities of power and privilege and the disparities that exist even in health systems, physical, medical health care systems, but also in our psychological systems as well. We want to also be tuned into intergenerational trauma, which some have named historical trauma, uh, and some have also named as an ancestral wound or ancestral trauma. So addressing with your clients the impact, the long-term consequences of the traumas that they have experienced directly, as well as the traumas of those who came before them. And so that gets transmitted to us in our present day reality in multiple ways. Uh, intergenerational trauma is transmitted physiologically, neurologically. We understand that trauma changes the brain. The good part is with neuroplasticity, that healing can also transform the brain and the body, uh, but that gets passed down in generations. Uh, there have been wonderful studies, important studies that have been done with descendants of the Holocaust uh, that document this reality. Not only does it get transmitted physiologically, but also our direct teaching, racial socialization, what we are told, what we are taught, how we should show up. And so for racially minoritized communities, often being told that you have to be twice as good, that you have to mask your, your uh, emotions, that you have to always be on, always be ready, always perform to the top in order to be acceptable, uh, that those kinds of messages, uh, they, they teach us how to make meaning of the stress and trauma of our lives. So when we talk to descendants of the Armenian genocide, we will see that. When we talk to descendants of the transatlantic slave trade, we will also see that. 
Um, and we also recognize it shows up through observation. So we learn by seeing noting how did your parents or those who took care of you transform in certain environments? How did the way they, he they held their bodies, the way they spoke, the way other people respond to them, how did that change? And so we want to be mindful when we're working with our clients about the stress and trauma of racism and other forms of oppression, including the realities of historical trauma. A barrier to being a liberation psychologist is when we have an allegiance to the training we received that was decontextualized. So when you learned to basically erase the cultural context of your clients and your own socio-political reality, you can have in your mind that that's what it means to be professional. And so then if I start talking about addressing oppression with your clients, some people will name that as my agenda, as if it is my personal uh, issue that I want clients to address versus it being in the water, in the air, that it is affecting the very ways in which people live and the way they grow or the way they are diminished. Uh, some people who enter the field have a very deficit uh, view of Black, Indigenous, people of color who are clients uh, coming in with this Messiah complex that we just need to save these vulnerable or at-risk communities that does not attend to our strengths and our resilience. Uh, if you get stuck in guilt and shame about the privilege you hold, but don't mobilize and engage around liberation, that will be a barrier. Denial and ignorance about the realities of people's lives uh, keep us from addressing them. When we operate from a place of fragility, so when we are ego-led and have to be the center, it will lead us to defending groups we are a part of that have caused harm to our clients. Another problem is performative allyship when we feel we have to make these statements, uh, but we are saying them out of pressure, not out of authenticity. And one of the things we know about trauma survivors is they are very good at reading what is real, what is true, what is authentic. And so also recognizing uh, that it is a barrier if we believe discussing racism is divisive, as opposed to needing to address it in order for healing to take place. So socio, uh, societal and historical trauma can show up in terms of psychological consequences, somatic complaints, and we see somatic complaints are more pervasive in racially and ethnically uh, marginalized communities. Uh, it shows up in disrupting our cognitive abilities, our difficulty concentrating and remembering. It diminishes our access to resources. It can show up with physical health consequences, including increased risk of death by COVID-19, increased risk of maternal death as well. It affects our relationship, our ability to trust and connect with each other, and it can also affect our spirituality. So liberation psychology is not just about coping or survival. It is about the empowerment of our clients. It is a focus on healing and transformation. It originated in Latin America and really prioritizes the experience of those who are living with the realities of oppression and marginalization. It does not ignore intrapsychic psychic factors, but it also makes room for the acknowledgement of systemic factors. And so a therapy that does not attend to and does not assess a person's experience with discrimination and inequality is incomplete. Not only that, it attends to our individual strengths and our collective strengths and cultural identities. The purpose of liberation psychology is not only to relieve suffering, but to look at the enhancement of people's lives, recognizing that the enhancements of our lives is not just about shifting our cognitions, but actually shifting the systems in which we need to live. So the founder of liberation psychology was both a priest and a community psychologist, which highlights the important intersection between spirituality and psychology. And what we find in our research is that uh, mental health professionals are less likely than the general public to endorse religiosity and spirituality. So what that means is often you have people 
who are not considered persons of faith facilitating and designing interventions for people who are largely communities of faith. Who are the people who are most likely to endorse spirituality and religiosity? People of color and women. And so what does it mean for us to design interventions that ignore the ways in which people make meaning in their lives? So our therapeutic foundations, a big piece of it is problematization. And so when we look to our case conceptualization, how do I understand the symptoms of distress that a person is manifesting? And if I don't recognize the impact of poverty on mental health, I will miss it. If I don't acknowledge the impact of racism, systemic racism and individual racism, then I will miss it. And so our problematization from a liberation standpoint requires that we look at not only the internal world, but the external world as well. A big part of liberation psychotherapy is also critical consciousness. And we see this as well in inter intersectional feminist therapy or multicultural feminist therapy, that there is an awareness raising or a psychoeducation for people about the impact of their outer world on their inner world. There also is a priority on indigenization, utilizing and embracing cultural wisdom and practices in order to enhance people's lives, recognizing that Western psychology does not have a monopoly on healing, uh, but has often borrowed from multiple cultures and utilized that within the therapeutic process. We utilize creativity, integrate spirituality, and liberation psychotherapy requires us addressing imposter syndrome or the ways in which internalized oppression shows up. And so for marginalized communities, whether it is about ability, sexuality, gender, or race, we are affected by being bombarded uh, by messages of our inferiority. We are bombarded by these messages um, of superiority versus inferiority. And so a part of our psychological wellness must address these factors. We also attend to self-care and community care, recognizing the importance of the community. Uh, one important intervention in liberation psychotherapy is testimonials, uh, which is the gift of giving people space to tell their stories, the stories of the injustices they have experienced without judgment, but when we respond with belief, with support, with empowerment, and with problem-solving, strategizing with resistance. So resistance is a big difference between traditional trauma or Western trauma response models and liberation models, that we don't wanna help trauma survivors just cope with the realities of oppression, but for them to think strategically and within themselves and within their communities about ways they can confront it and uproot it. And so the testimonials or telling our story in this narrative approach is also seen in African-centered psychology, for example, in the Saul Bona healing circles, where people gather, Black people gather, to tell their experiences uh, about the impact of racism. And Saul Bona is a uh, Zulu greeting, which means I see you. And so a part of our healing is being able to see each other. I want to name that liberation psychology indigenizes psychology to recognize culture is a resource, culture is medicine. So we do not just inherit wounds from uh, cultural oppression, but we also inherit wisdom. And so culture is healing. When people are surrounded by messages of their inferiority, but are given racial socialization or gender socialization or socialization around their sexuality or their ability that lets them know the value, the beauty, the genius, the contribution of their community that is healing and liberating. So there has been some criticism of liberation psychology. Um, historically, there was erasure or marginalization of women and LGBTQ plus clients 
and more recent scholars have responded with feminist liberation psychology, womanist and muharista psychologies, and LGBTQ plus liberation psychology, which we will hear about today. We are taught and reminded by Afupe, a scholar of Nigerian descent, that when we come to do liberation psychology, we must show up with radical humility and authentic collaboration. Finally, I will say liberation psychology is not just about how you practice, but how you live. So I invite you to think about what is it you are seeking to be liberated from and what is it you are seeking to be liberated to, to be what or to do what, for us to learn to decolonize our joy, to recognize the sacredness of our rest and to know the beauty of us being fully alive to be healers, to be practitioners, is not to show up as blank slates, but to show up holistically in order to know that together, collaboratively, justice will come. And as justice comes, healing comes as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Tatema, that is so inspiring. So um, I'm Dr. Carrie Castaneda the Sound and I'm going to share my screen. So give me one moment. Okay. All right. Oh goodness to presentation. Welcome. It's so exciting to join everyone on this Wellness Wednesday. Um, today I want to talk about liberation psychology and what it looks like um, in, when you integrate it into professional training. Um, first, I want to start off with um, a short story about my own training. Um, I noticed about three years into my doctoral program, I attended a conference for the, the first conference for the National Latinx Psychological Association. And I remember listening to a program where three early career psychologists were talking and sharing their professional journey. And they all agreed that after graduating with their PhDs and working directly in Latinx communities that they realized they had to unlearn everything that was taught to them in their graduate programs. And immediately I decided this is unacceptable. I just, I, I'm not spending all this money to unlearn what I did to work with my community. Um, so one of the things I did was go outside of psychology to find better ways of working with communities. Um, I found these answers in ethnic and cultural psychology studies, uh, social psychology, critical educational studies. And this is where initially I was exposed to the work of Paolo Freire and Ignacio Martín Baró and, and a host of scholars in critical race theory. You know, the, when you're looking for something, you feel lost in a field that you've committed to. And when you find it, it speaks not just to your mind, but to your soul. And that's how, how I felt. And their work reflected the lived experiences, not just of my clients, but of my family members um, and their generational challenges with institutions of power. When I work with graduate students, currently I'm in a, I work in a CITE program and a master's uh, program, we regularly reflect on these questions. It, and they compel us to examine ourselves and our positionality within the institutions we work um, and the students we work with and the communities where we live. We're not just focusing on disparities and disconnections, but we're building bridges. We're seeking where are the spots that we can build these bridges. So when I think of uh, Paolo Freire, his work inspired educators from across the globe about his approach to critical pedagogy. And I have to add that he wasn't talking about learning and education within uh, the four walls of a classroom. He's talking broadly about learning, about how do we um, internalize the teachings of the worlds we live in. And he talks about authentic liberation, the process of humanization, and it's not just another deposit to be made. It's something, it's an interactional uh, living in the world. And, and it really takes us as clinicians, as educators too, to be realistic about the day-to-day -day concerns and interests, not just of our students, but also of their clients in the communities they live in. And we see this with food insecurity, 
with uh, lack of even garbage collection, uh, lack of um, employment opportunities. And these are the realistic stressors uh, for the folks we live with, or we live in the communities we live. So this became very real to me in my training working in Salt Lake City when my clients were saying, hey, can you help me call the gas company? Um, they're about to turn turn off the gas because of they didn't I, either they didn't pay their bill because of financial reasons or what have you. And and one of the reasons was primarily because the gas company didn't have staff that spoke Spanish. And and this was this was real for them. I see this in uh, clients we give sometimes uh, homework, like go for a walk to manage your stress, yet not really considering the environment and how much there might be high rates of community violence in their neighborhoods. So these are the, the type of challenges the students I work with come bring to the classroom. And although we can immediately do problem solving, we often have to step back and think about what is our relationship to these issues, these systems of power? How can we um, what are our experiences with this in our lives? And this is a bigger, small piece of a bigger puzzle uh, for decolonizing the classroom. I get concerned when I, when I see conversations about decolonizing our classroom and they just say, give me a syllabus, you know, and I, I immediately think, whoa, this is way more than just a syllabus. Um, this means embracing a liberation psych that is, it, it, that is holistic. It's immersive, it's a way of living, and it's a way of being congruent with the communities we're working in. It takes quite a bit of cultural humility. And I think when I, when I see a liberation psych um, approach specifically, um, this really needs to be embedded throughout the curriculum. Um, it can involve opportunities for immersion programs. And there's so many different ways of embedding this in our research as well. It really compels us to rethink the values we hold dearest in our teaching and our approach to learning. Um, instead, we're asked to reclaim and to um, explore and reclaim ancestral ways of knowing. Uh, there's a robust literature about decolonizing curricula, uh, critical pedagogy, indigenizing cur curricula, and I encourage you to explore these amazing readings. It'll help you reflect on your ideas about teaching, assessment, and grading. There's a whole movement around ungrading. A common practice for me is to present a syllabus that's very raw. And my class, we have a discussion about, is this what you want to learn? Will this benefit your clients? What's missing? If your clients were in the room right now, what would they think about these readings? And these are conversations from the get-go we have. And actually, uh, Dr. Tame and I teach a year-long uh, course. She does the first semester. I do the second. And regularly, I say, can you ask the students, what do they want more of? What do they... They want um, in their next semester of learning. This is critical to a decolonized approach. Clearly, some of the largest systemic influences tend to be well-intentioned, but sometimes they create tensions when working from a liberation psych um, framework within higher education. And they include requirements from accrediting bodies, licensing boards, and community agencies and hospitals. And I see this as an opportunity where we can reflect on who do these requirements serve? Are they in the best interest of the communities we serve? And this is really not a one size fits all approach. Ignacio Martin Barro says, what we need is the revision from the bottom up of our most basic assumptions of psychological thought. So, so really reflecting on what are we taking for granted in our approaches is a critical piece of the, of the learning. He also adds that we must take into account the context of our clients' lives, and most importantly, the history, history of the communities we are serving, and not just their history, but the relationship of my histories, ancestral histories, and how they have intersected with those of my clients. So one article I, I'd like to share, I, you know, this is getting really specific, but um, it was written by Sofia Villanueva, Dr. Villanueva, um, it's in 2013, talks about decolonizing a classroom and creating spaces for hopeful resistance. 
Um, she shares her process with teaching a writing class at a two-year college with a class that was primarily Latinx. And she lays out um, the steps for her for working from a liberatory frame. This resonated with me in the way she shared her testimonial because I heard uh, my experiences in hers. And this has been faculty maybe even talking about students um, who were quote, bad writers or horrible writers. Um, while not stated directly, students picked up on these messages and internalized them. It's very harmful. <laughs> and I can say from experience that this internalization is not helpful to growth and thriving as future psychologists. It's not surprising that these often were the same students who were women of color. Dr. Villanueva shares her approach by addressing the inherent inheritance of intergenerational traumas, as well as emerging from working class households, uh, being first generation college students coming from bilingual homes, facing undocumented immigrant status and confronting often daily cultural attacks in the form of racial discrimination, among others. This is a, a framework that she references as uh, Edmundo Norte's work um, about humanizing pedagogy and the process of decolonization addressing historical trauma. Now, this sounds odd to be in a classroom, right? Because this is one of the taboos is like, well, this isn't therapy, right? And so those are is this example where we have to really say, what is our training value? How are we looking at? We have a framework of the self of the therapist. So where, um, where does this end and where does it begin in terms of what is considered therapy and what is considered healing? Um, so what, what Norte emphasizes is it's not enough to ask students to participate in an intellectual activity that incites critical awareness. We're great at that. We're great at deconstructing all day. But to devote a space only for critiques without offering hope is to ensure despair. And his, his approach includes first this rediscovery or recovery which leads to an enhanced awareness. This often happens for my students through the readings, through the uh, videos, through the dialogue they have. Next is a confrontation, not a you know, intellectualization, but a confrontation of the pain, guilt, shame, baggage, and even wounds that might be requiring mourning, uh, which then sometimes often in my class creates a uh, collective healing. And, and it really, and I will add that it, the, as I mentioned in the first quote, the instructor is not disconnected from the process. They are, you know, he, she, you know, they are connected to this transformative practice. Finally, he sees that this is the creative part. A dream is made, a commitment to the dream for this healing, and then action is taken. So for, for Dr. Villanueva, she identifies different aspects of decolonizing the classroom, one being identifying community cultural wealth. Uh, we might say that, you know, these are the strengths of communities we work with, but we must also identify, contextualize these strengths, right? And, and see in what, in what areas are these strengths useful and not for our clients. Um, the course readings, this is something that I, the way I've approached it is multidisciplinary articles, reading testimonials, think pieces, looking for open source readings for our uh, students who often are for cash and, and paying for uh, education is, is more than they can really bear sometimes. So I try to really think of what my client, uh, students can manage. Um, I also use poetry, um, and I'll share some of those other examples. Community building means some I often try to get them out of the classroom. So we will, um, historically, I've taken about four or five classes across two different universities um, to Mexico. We've gone to Argentina and, and connected with organizations in those countries. Clearly, this was before COVID. Um, locally, I've explored... Uh, Theater of the Oppressed, uh, inspired by uh, Ball and uh, Dr. Jason Plant, Platt, who I've worked with in Mexico City. And this is getting them out and creating dialogue with people in the community. And finally, in Lekic, um, which means like, you are my other me, 
Uh, I see you and me, and if I do harm to you, I do harm to myself. And this is how she writes about it, is love as an interventionist methodology, showing compassion, love, and kindness, not just to our students, but um, when we think about the clients they serve. So I wanted to give some examples of uh, multidisciplinary approaches. So uh, one might be considered uh, the uh, show, talking about arvieras. Uh, these, these were common, these textiles that were often made by women, but could have been made by men too, um, that were common in Chile during military dic dictatorship and served as sources of income for those who were affected by forced disappearances. Um, desaparecidos, those who were taken from the home and disappeared. Uh, this was another form of a form of resistance that you can see in other countries as well that have struggled with oppression. So this is a springboard to say, where are we seeing these forms of resistance through creativity in our clients' lives? How are we enacting it as well? So uh, the next slide is poetry. Uh, this is a beautiful poem by uh, Paula Klug uh, from Mexico, and she wrote a poem called Ven Trenzaray Mi Tristeza, and it talks about braiding your hair. Um, it's telling her grandmother how she told her to braid her sadness into her hair um, so that the pain doesn't get trapped in her head, in her body. And, and, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful poem. And what I think what we do as a class is first I kind of have to translate it, but uh, we uh, connect this to the theories uh, that they've been learning in classes around, um, you know, somatic experiencing and so on. So, you know, some other meanings of this poem is, for instance, the grandmother used to say that when a woman felt sad, the best thing she could do is braid her hair. In this way, the pain would be trapped between the hairs and could not reach the rest of the body. You had to be careful that sadness did not get into your eyes because it would make them rain. It was not good to let um, it enter our lips because it would force us to say things that were not true. And don't get it between your hands because it will affect, uh, it, it'll affect the coffee you make and the, the dough that you are trying to cook and it gives a bitter taste. So the last part I think is the most powerful where it says our hair is a net capable of catching everything. It's strong like the roots of a aguahuete and soft like the foam of the atol. So I think what we need to think of is as a class we explore this and say what are the messages? Is Are we seeing this in the clients and the communities we work with and in what ways? Is this useful? Yes and no. And so as you can see it becomes one source of, of conversation and learning. Um, another place that I try to embed creativity with the students is um, through a form of theater of the press. And this is, like I mentioned, Dr. Jason Platt did in Mexico City by the Metro, is having, having a scene. In this one, the students picked about five scenes. And here's one where the piece was, can I touch your hair? And it's a white woman going to touch a black woman's hair. And um, and, and just standing there and as people walk around, they react to it. And then we have other students in, in the crowd having conversations. What was so fascinating in the scene, um, it garnered a lot of discussion with women of all races and ethnicity passing by. Some black women passing by could relate to the experience and had a lot to say about this racist experience. So it creates an opportunity to dialogue with community, to um, strategize, and inform. There were other people who are saying, I don't get it. Why is that a problem? And then there could be some education. Um, it just creates a jumping off point for a lot of important education. Well, I tried to give you a glimpse into what it looks like. I would say more than anything, um, it's a learning process. It's not, you're not going to get it perfect. You're going to, I'm always learning. Um, and we have to learn from our mistakes. Um, I co-authored a chapter with two of my graduate students who were in our program and included their testimonials, their stories. And one of the, what stood out to me most was when they shared 
all the negative criticism or, or concern that they were going to take this year long track. And it was these, these colonized mentalities, in, in, you know, embedded in fear. And it said, you know, they said to them, well, are you going to be able to get an internship? Are you going to pass the clinical competency exams if you do this? And, and a lot of fear. And so they shared their process for going, moving through that and out of it and how now, you know, they're in postdocs, cultural neuropsych postdocs, and they're thriving. And they're now kind of being able to share uh, this approach that is so highly valued in the different spaces that they have found themselves in. I would say that uh, another consejo advice is while addressing oppression is critical, it's also important to shed light on resistance, the different transformational resistance that exists in communities and, and our students could be stewards of, as well as the creation, the, the energy around creating ideas. And finally, we just, we must continue to inspire and that that's important for this work to thrive. So that's it. Thank you very much. It was fun talking about this. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Castaneda Sound. And I just loved listening to both you and Dr. Tama Brian Davis. I learned so much from each of you every time I interact with you. My name is Annalise Singh. I use she and they pronouns. And I hope if you're a member of the American Psychological Association, you have opened up your email and given your top votes to Dr. Tama, Tama Bryant Davis. Um, I think it's kind of the birth of this uh, webinar really is that we, we need to transform as a discipline, as a community. And I think you all could very clearly see where we can go with her leadership. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about liberation psychology and <clears throat> excuse me, queer and trans communities. As we go through this, we'll name colonization, we'll uplift resilience, we'll tear it apart, and then hopefully uh, reclaim some ancient histories, her stories, and I would say T trans stories. And, you know, as I come into the space, I just want to identify myself as a South Asian, mixed race, queer, genderqueer femme, someone who is temporarily uh, non-disabled and uh, has a hell of a lot of class and education privilege and so many other parts of my intersecting identities I'm continuing to learn about. Um, and as we get started, I'm going to try to be really brief because uh, I want to make sure to get to your questions. Um, so pardon me while I fly through these slides. But one of the things I have to do is, you know, I am right now in the land we call New Orleans, the land that the first peoples, the first nations, indigenous Native Americans called Omancha, uh, the land of many tongues at the mouth of the Mississippi River. And I just, I hope that each of you is keeping New Orleans and southeastern Louisiana on the top of your hearts and minds. Uh, all the things that we're talking about today are here post Hurricane Ida, and there is a lot of need for support and action. I also, I know it feels like a faint echo at this point, uh, probably not for this community gathered here today, but certainly in terms of the types and the intensity of conversations we were having after a uh, white police officer Chauvin uh, murdered uh, black man George Floyd. And so I just wanted to bring in that context. I know Dr. Bryant Davis built so much context for us. Thank you again. Um, but you know, when we do a land acknowledgement, when we kind of name anti-black racism and we think about you know, the, what Kadir Nelson, who uh, created this image on the cover of The New Yorker, is trying to say about the history of anti-Black racism we didn't learn, you know, we can't talk about liberation or liberation psychology unless we talk about Indigenous erasure, you know, kind of the image on the bottom of who got to be white and deemed white in terms of encoded in law in the land we now call the United States of America, about, you know, this land we've lived on that we call the U.S. of A today, I mean, Spanish has always been the dominant language spoken, you know, other than indigenous languages uh, way back when. And now um, we certainly haven't talked about the internment, the anti-API racism. We've seen so much of this conversation about liberation. We have to ground in conversations about systemic racism. And 
I'm bringing in the queer and trans uh, pieces of this. I think you heard uh, Dr. Bryant Davis touch on this as well in terms of her positionalities. But you know, last summer, we certainly weren't having the conversation around Black trans women who were still being murdered, right? Um, I, I kind of think of a liberation psychology in our profession, one that's so robust, that's so alive, that's so resistant and transforming our profession that people like Dominique Remy Fells and Rhea Milton get to actually live. So I wanted to take a little time to dedicate the space uh, and where we're going, and I'm going to be very fast. Uh, we're going to locate ourselves in terms of our gender, sexualities, and other identities and liberation psychology. We're going to tease apart some of the colonization, anti-Black racism, and internalized whiteness. Certainly, that was some of uh, what Dr. Castaneda Salm was talking about as well. But right away, I want to name in psychology and counseling and the mental health professions Ooh, the white, like gay cis folks were doing it. They were doing that academic thing where it's like, we got to affirm ourselves, right? There was so much, if you go to the early writing on gay and lesbian and bisexual communities and psychology, we just needed to affirm some stuff, right? And I became part of that as I was kind of coming into the academy too, as I was doing trans and non-binary work, I was like, yes, we need to affirm, we need to affirm. But if we look at the definition of affirmation, Y'all, it ain't got anything to do with liberation. It just says that something is true. And so I wanna bring up the definition of liberation. And so really tying it, and I think this is what Fanon and Lord and Hooks and Freire and Martin Barrow, they were all talking about, you know, our liberation scholars today who are in the chat box already and doing so many exciting things. You know, we're talking about freedom. You know, that's the psychology we're looking to build, you know, whether we're going back to sources that have written before us or whether we're writing new source material today, it's about freeing someone, ourselves, uh, these removals of traditions, which are kind of grounded in so much cis het ridiculousity. I'll just say, I know that's not a professional word, but y'all know what I'm talking about. And I think as we start to look at liberation psychology, I was like, I start, you know, of course I was so enthralled. I was like, I finally found my people like, and then I started reading more deeply and I was like, but wait, where are my people? Like my BIPOC, my black indigenous people of color, my queer and trans communities, liberation psychology, silent on these uh, intersections. And then I was like, hmm, when I actually think about liberation and I think about all the liberatory scholars from Sojourner Truth, you know, to Kimberly Crenshaw today, to all the people who teach us and refine our understandings of liberation, I was like, wow, like BIPOC queer and trans communities, we bought, we're the origin story. And so I know I'm making a bold claim when I say that, obviously that claim goes back to the continent of Africa because that's where all humans came from. And it's very important to look at our Latinx, our Latin, our Hispanic roots of liberation psychology. We must, we must, we must. But we are living in the land that we now call the United States of America. And, and we've got to look at who's been leading our liberation movements. Um, and it most commonly has been dark skinned people, right? Uh, queer and trans folks. All we have to do is look at the birth of Black Lives Matter. And there we see ourselves. We see our BIPOC, queer, and largely women's community, right? And so I think we're at a turning point in our conversation in liberation psychology where we can actually start to kind of go in and be like, ooh, we've been calling in this whole community, the people. Liberation psychologists have always called in the people, that our psychology should be of the people. And so it demands asking ourselves who we are. But when we do that, we have to ask liberation psychology a question. Why are we continuing to erase gender and sexuality? from our conversations when they're such strong organizers. Now we have to talk about race as the base of all of that, right? But it gets really interesting when you start digging in and you're like, well, wait, how did we get erased in the first place? And you know, when we know that on every continent and every culture, everywhere in the globe, that queer and trans folks, we've been there. We've been there. We've, we've always been here. And actually the legacies of queer and trans communities of color, I mean, they're not just queer and trans ancestors as we like to call them. They're actually the gender ancestors of cis and straight folks too, because y'all get tied up in some boxes as well. 
And so the conversation I want us to, to encourage us to have in psychology and the mental health professions is this isn't just about queer and trans folks. This is about reteaching all of ourselves about the origins of our gender and sexuality stories from the beginning. And colonization is really what's ripped those stories away, right? I mean, for many of our cultures and communities, you know, our queer and trans folks, the folks who held multiple genders and sexualities, we actually held the sacred. Not always, I don't want to generalize, but we were often the ones that were the helpers, the healers, right? How did we become the hated, the stigmatized, you know, with high rates of HIV and uh, STIs? I got to see this as a mixed race South Asian uh, person growing up when I'd visit my family in India, I'd see the Hijra who would, uh, the trans people of South Asia who would offer, you know, blessings on the occasions of marriages and births and, and then yet they were also scorned. Well, all that happened, British colonization, colonization sucks for all of us, right? So I think in psychology, we've got to go way beyond William James. William James just coined psychology. That's all he did. It's a white guy who came up with some words. We got to get, go even way back to the continent of Africa to really reteach ourselves about those original indigenous um, healing traditions. And so I think some of what we've been gifted in liberation psychology can actually help us get there. But if we also start applying these to uh, queer and trans communities, so we're not forgotten, so we're in the story, we're in the origin story. And I think what that means in psychology in general is as we recover that historical memory, as we look at the impact of colonization, we're also seeing like, hey, what have we lost personally, professionally? I ask each of you attending, what kind of boxes are you still trying to conform in, in terms of your gender and sexuality that don't work for you, certainly don't work for queer and trans communities. You you know, consciousness raising. I mean, so many scholars talked about this from Anzal Dua to Friere to Martin Barrow, Lord, Hooks, et cetera. But, you know, how are we raising consciousness about reclaiming our gender and sexualities and really de-ideologizing psychology, this idea of making psychology for the people. We heard that so strongly in what Dr. Tamar Bryant Davis said. But what that means is we have to problematize our field and say, actually, you know, why do we have a DSM? I know that comes out of psychiatry, but we use it every day. Why don't we have a heterosexism disorder not otherwise specified? Why don't we have a racism disorder, a white supremacy disorder not otherwise specified? If we have these problematizing conversations, we've got to actually build that realism critical, which is that psychology of the people. But again, if we're only doing it in name only, just kind of talking about these tenets over and over again, we're, we're losing the body, um, our genders, our sexualities, our lack of sexuality, all those things have to do with the home we find in ourselves. And so again, I want to make sure to get to questions. So I'm going to be quick here, but for your discipline, for your practice, for your research, for your advocacy, I encourage you to think about for yourself, you know, um, what is the tiniest way you can experience freedom in your gender and sexuality, whether you're cis, straight, LGBTQ+, this is about you, this is about you, and once you make it about you, you can make it about queer and trans folks and building those more liberatory environments. How can you use those psychology, liberation psychology tenets to learn and relearn the lineage of queer and trans resistance within and outside liberation psychology? We've got some reclaiming to do within liberatory communities, right? And when we start to center those colonization and resistance stories, then we can actually start to embed that countering of internalized whiteness and anti-Blackness, that colonization thing every day. So it's not just for queer and trans communities, it's for all of us. And then we can kind of think that liberation destination, we've got to talk about resilience, y'all, as resistance, as the things we have to, especially queer and trans folks, have to develop to survive as we move towards liberation and as we move towards thriving. And this might seem like an odd place to stop, uh, but I really, for those of you who have been able to see Michaela's um, speech at the Emmys, I think she gives us a teaching, especially for uh, BIPOC, queer and trans communities, but for all communities engaging uh, liberation psychology, is that there's some, I feel it sometimes in the moments we're in right now, where it starts to begin about the performativity. It's about like, well, how do we do this? And what are all the steps? And 
and you know, I really do think liberation is, you know, we do need some quiet times. It's it's the things that we feel when we're sometimes alone or when we're with our bestest friend or or that relationship where we actually can start to feel the freedom bubble up in our heart or feel it very deeply in our bones. And Michaela said the other night, she said, and she was talking about social media, right? In a world that entices us to browse through the lives of others to help us better determine how we feel about ourselves. Um, and in turn to feel the need to be constantly visible because visibility, visibility these days seems somehow to equate to success. Um, Michaela reminded us, do not be afraid to disappear and see what comes to you in the silence. I just really want our liberation psychology to, community to do that right now uh, because the answers are certainly going to be in these scholars we've noticed and cited and need to cite more of but it's going to be in the dream building the dream building we haven't even really been getting we're just at the beginning of a lot of this and we need your personal stories of liberation to really shape that so I know we are very short in time for questions. Thanks. That's all right. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. And I have loved seeing all of the responses in the chat. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Reynolds for a closing comment. And I will just say one of the questions was for graduate students uh, who are uh, marginalized, under, underrepresented. And I just want to say connect with resources within your department, but also outside of your department and pace yourself so that you can be nourished because you can feel like it is your job to revolutionize your department. And in the meantime, that has a cost. So while you are doing the efforts and it's important to do these efforts for transformation, but also to tend to the wellness of your own soul. Uh, Dr. Reynolds. Thank you so much. And what a wonderful panel, a great opportunity. Join us in Division 17. We're committed to transformation and engaging with each other and with other divisions like 35 to uh, address these important questions. Again, it's been in the chat, but remember to vote if you're an APA member for Dr. Tema. And we encourage you to get involved uh, beyond webinars within your divisions, within your communities to bring liberation to everyone, including ourselves. So thank you everyone. And uh, this video will be up on the Division 17 website. So you can look for it there. <clears throat> and it will likely, I think, probably be on your website eventually too, Tama, right? Um, yes, it will be on my website, definitely, and on our YouTube page. And I will just close from this with this phrase from Sweet Honey and the Rock, an acapella group that I love. We are the ones, we are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the ones. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Take care, everyone.